voting is underway in Ghana in a tight presidential election. Frantic rescue efforts are ongoing in Indonesia after a deadly earthquake. And there's hope for Tunisia's economy as donors pledge millions of dollars in aid and loans. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. This is Africa 54. Vincent McCory is off today. We begin in Ghana this evening where voting is underway in neck and neck presidential and parliamentary elections. Two candidates dominate the race. President John Mahama, who is seeking a second term in office, and his main rival, Nana Akufo Addo, a veteran politician and businessman. High unemployment and corruption scandals have beset Mahama's presidency, but he's asking Ghanaians to re-elect him. But Akufo Ado believes he has the business acumen to turn the economy around. VOA's Paul Ndio spoke to one small business owner in Accra who says the stakes could not be higher. Incumbent President Jonna Mahama is running for a second and final four-year term in office under a National Democratic Congress NDC ticket. He has made the proposals to boost our industry, energy, infrastructure, health and education. His main opponent, Nana Akofo Ado, and his new patriotic party criticizes Mahama for squandering the wealth the country has amassed since it began producing oil in 2010 and being out of touch with ordinary people. Akofo Ado promises to give every constituency the equivalent of $1 million dollars a year to alleviate our poverty by installing basic services such as electricity, running water, and sanitation. Mabel Simpson is an accessories designer and entrepreneur working in Accra. I started um, the M Sims brand with um, hundred dollars, with just one person assisting me, and um, eventually we've grown to have four full-time workers on board, and then we have some contract stuff on board as well. And now we just don't supply to individuals, we supply to corporate institutions as well and also sell outside of Ghana. She resigned her office job in 2010 to launch her own clothing label, M. Sims. Since then, she has created quite a buzz on the Ghanaian fashion scene. Ghana needs a leader who is going to fight corruption who is going to bring jobs, especially for the young people, and who is also going to make sure that the manufacturing industry in Ghana is doing very well. Simpson's a fascination with fashion and love for raw African prints started when she was a young girl. She now competes with some of the biggest names in the African fashion industry. Today, her design label M. Sims sells products in a store in Accra and online for clients are making orders from all over the world. Ghana exports gold, oil and cocoa, but has suffered from a slump in global commodity prices and macroeconomic instability in the form of inflation that stood at 15% last month, an elevated budget deficit and high unemployment. We need to cut down on imports and rather concentrate more on exports so that we can grow the economy. So whichever leader that I feel is, is you know, going to actually implement these policies, I think that leader is going to have my vote. Ms. Simpson says that she wants Ghana to invest more in manufacturing and export of made in Ghana products and to provide more support for entrepreneurs as a way of dealing with unemployment and boosting the economy. I'm also looking for a leader who is going to make sure that young startups or entrepreneurs have some tax rebate so that we can grow the economy and employ more people. Fashion experts say the industry has tremendous potential to meet the growing demand for high-end products in the global market, including Africa's growing middle class. Simpson says that young African designers can play a significant role on the continent through entrepreneurship as the M. Simpson label becomes more popular and expands. Other young African designers are looking forward to expressing their creativity in the marketplace. Paul Ndiho, VOA News, Washington.
Well, polls are set to close in Ghana in a short while. Remember, this is a hotly contested election. And in about three days' time, Ghanaians will know who their next president will be. Now, our correspondent, Peter Clotty, is in the capital of Accra. He joins us on the phone right now. Peter, good evening. You have been moving throughout the city today. Um, you've been speaking to voters. What is the latest? Well, we seem to have lost Peter Clotty there. We're going to take you to Indonesia now, or we will stay with the story in Ghana. Meanwhile, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, says she is hopeful the Ghanaian elections will be peaceful. In an exclusive interview with a VOA at the U.S. Embassy in Accra, Thomas-Greenfield told our reporter, Peter Clotty, that Washington supports Ghana's democratic process. I am optimistic. Uh, Ghana has a history of uh, generally peaceful elections, and Ghana has a history of democracy. It's a beacon of democracy for uh, most of the continent, but particularly for this region. So my expectation is that the people of Ghana will go to the polls on December 7th, and they will choose the president of their choice uh, in a peaceful, free, and fair uh, process. And the United States government will look forward to working with whomever the people choose to be uh, their next president. You met with officials of the Electoral Commission. What, what were your views on, um, did they give you any reassurances? Because there have been some criticisms here and there. Uh, there's always criticism of the Electoral Commission. They seem to be uh, uh, the lightning rod uh, for criticism. But uh, I would say that they are working diligently to prepare for an election that is credible. Uh, they, we talked about some of the challenges that they are facing and how they are working to address those challenges, to address the questions, to uh, address uh, uh, disinformation, and also to make sure that the voting public has the right information to move forward in the election. So I left my meetings with, uh, with them very uh, uh, confident uh, that they are committed to a free and fair and transparent election. And I think my biggest concern is that the election process be a peaceful one and that the candidates call upon their supporters to support them with their vote, not uh, in going into the streets. Uh, and any uh, efforts to uh, participate in violence should uh, be, be called out and people should be told that they will be held accountable mm. if they use violence to uh, promote uh, themselves and to encourage their, their supporters. So what's the, uh, Washington's support to Ghana's democratic process, if I may ask? Uh, you know, I, I would say I, I think it's clear uh, from everything we've done, uh, not just in the three and a half years that I've been assistant secretary, that we support democracy and we support good governance uh, on the continent of Africa. So uh, the Ghana election is one that is very important to us. We have supported this process with about seven million U.S. dollars that we have given uh, partially to the Electoral Commission, uh, to the uh, Peace uh, Commission, and also to civil society so that they can train election observers and uh, and election monitors. Recently, I um, had discussions with both the president, incumbent president John Dramani Mahama, and Anadu Danko Akufado, the main opposition leader. What was the import of the discussion between these two uh, officials? I think uh, I, I, this was reported out in the press, so you've you've seen the report outs of uh, of the discussion. But the basis for the phone calls was to encourage both of them. Uh, to uh, and urge both of them to uh, encourage a peaceful process in the election and to make sure that none of their supporters use violence as a means of showing support uh, to them. They were also both encouraged to sign the, uh, the, the peace uh, agreement, mm -hmm. and they both did, and uh, we're very pleased about that. So what would you say would be your expectations? Because uh, 
there seemed to be a little tension because it, it's expected to be one of the most competitive elections in a long time since the reintroduction of constitutional rule in 1992. You know, all of your elections have been competitive and they've been very, very close. Uh, so I expect that will happen uh, this time around as well. So that's why it's so important that people get out and vote uh, if they support a, uh, a particular uh, candidate and show, again, their support through their vote and not, uh, and not through, through violence. Whatever happens in the election, we have a strong relationship with the country and the people of Ghana. We have worked very closely with President Mahama during uh, his tenure. And if he is reelected, we will continue to work uh, with him. And we have worked closely with Nana uh, when he was uh, foreign minister of the country mm -hmm. and in previous capacities as the minister of justice. And if he should win the election, we look forward to working closely with him as well. The choice will be made by the people of Ghana, not by the United States and not even by the candidates themselves. Right. The people of Ghana will go to the polls on Wednesday morning and cast their vote for their candidate. And it looks like from everything we've heard, it's going to be a close race. Mm -hmm. And we will all be waiting on uh, uh, with bated breath to see what the final result will be. And we will congratulate the winner and we will encourage the, the loser to uh, accept graciously the results of the election and continue to support Ghana's democracy. Well, that was VOA's Peter Clotty speaking with the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Linda Thomas-Greenfield. We're moving to Asia now, where frantic rescue efforts are ongoing in Indonesia's Aceh province after a deadly earthquake. Officials say at least 97 people have been killed and the death toll is expected to rise. Rescuers are now continuing to pull bodies from the rubble. The magnitude 6.5 earthquake struck just before dawn southeast of the city of Banda Aceh. It lasted about 15 seconds, and by the time it was over, more than 200 buildings had been destroyed, including shops, schools, and mosques. The U.S. Geological Survey says this was a shallow earthquake that did not generate a tsunami. But for people in the region, it's another terrifying reminder of the December 2004 earthquake, which triggered a devastating tsunami and killed more than 100,000 people. Well, we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover here. You can join the conversation on Facebook. The address there is Africa 54. And do check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, after suffering a bruising election defeat by the Republicans last month, is it time for America's Democratic Party to reinvent itself? Stay with us. I am Sheikha Sali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. Welcome back. We turn to business news now. The world is a much different place than it was at the turn of the century. Thanks to globalization of economies and more recently, Donald Trump's shocking November 8th election victory. But what's the impact on Africa, especially in the light of Chinese investment on the continent? Well, Africa 54's business correspondent, Jill Malandrino, joins us live from New York. Jill, hello. Hi, good morning. So Trump's win and early actions are being perceived as a major blow to the advocates of globalization, many of whom have also been champions of increased foreign aid to and trade with developing countries with the aim of reducing poverty and promoting economic growth and development. In fact, one of President Obama's greatest legacies will be his policy on Africa and investment. One topic we touch on frequently for this show is China's investment in the continent and the skepticism surrounding it. And I think it will be interesting to see how China's role expands in Africa and potentially emerge as the leader in global trade if President-elect Trump truly adopts a severe isolation policy. Speaking of China expanding in Africa, China is investing in nearly every African country. Why do you think then Africans remain so skeptical of Chinese investment? 
Well, China is now Africa's largest trading partner with a substantial aid and investment portfolio in virtually every country on the continent, as you mentioned. Much of the attention with China and Africa has been focused on the controversies around the blurred boundaries between aid and true investment, the lack of transparency on aid practices, and the lack of focus on democracy, human rights, and gender equality. Um, Jill, what is the difference between how Chinese versus Western aid is implemented? I read an interesting case study on Malawi out of the University of Oslo in Norway, and they made a great case on the distinction. Although China also provides aid directed at the agricultural and medical sectors, in addition to stipends and grants for travel to China, Chinese activities are mainly related to infrastructural projects implemented in Malawi. Now, Chinese neither support the Malawian government through budget support nor um, explicitly provide democratic uh, consolidation or agendas. Therefore, Western donors often believe that their activities usefully complement those of China and Malawi. Nonetheless, the Chinese believe their aid practices are much more in tune with what Malawi requires rather than Western donors who wish to impose conditionalities on the aid recipient country. Well, Jill Malandrino, Africa 54's business correspondent, speaking to us from New York. Jill, as always, a pleasure. Thank you very much. Well, U.S. President-elect Donald Trump has stressed his vision of non-interventionist foreign policy for the United States. He says, as he did during his campaign, that he does not want American forces fighting, as he put it, in areas we shouldn't be fighting in. Speaking during his thank you rally in North Carolina, Trump said his focus will be on defeating terrorists, including the Islamic State group. And finally, a commitment to only engage the use of military forces when it's in the vital national security interests of the United States. We don't want to have a depleted military because we're all over the place fighting in areas that just we shouldn't be fighting in. From now on, it's going to be America first. America first. We will stop racing to topple foreign, re and, and you understand this, foreign regimes that we know nothing about, that we shouldn't be involved with. Well, Trump says the U.S. must end what he calls a destructive cycle of intervention and chaos. He promised to build up the military to project strength, not aggression. Meanwhile, Trump formally announced his pick for Secretary of Defense, retired Marine General James Mattis. Mattis served as head of U.S. Central Command, which carries out U.S. operations in the Middle East. Staying with politics, U.S. President Barack Obama on Tuesday touted his administration's achievements in combating terrorists. In his final speech on national security delivered at Florida's McDill Air Force Base, Obama said the U.S. has weakened the Islamic State and reduced its image to that of barbarians and murderers and that al-Qaeda has been sidelined with the death of its leader Osama bin Laden. The president warned that Americans must uphold the country's values for continued success in defeating terrorism. In his address at MacDill Air Force Base, the president said his administration was successful in fighting terrorism thanks to a new strategy of engaging local partners in the Middle East and Asia. Instead of pushing all of the burden onto American ground troops, instead of trying to mount invasions wherever terrorists appear, we've built a network of partners. Obama noted that al-Qaeda is a shadow of its former self after the killing of its leader Osama bin Laden. He said the military power of Islamic State is also weakened after the United States and its allies dismantled its financial resources and the ability to attract young people into its ranks. We've attacked ISIL's financial lifeline, destroying hundreds of millions of dollars of oil and cash reserves. The bottom line is we are breaking the back of ISIL. We're taking away its safe havens, and we have, and, and we've accomplished all this at a cost of ten billion dollars over ten uh, over two years, which is the same amount that we used to spend in one month at the height of the Iraq war. Obama said all this has been achieved without using torture or linking Muslims to terrorism. He also said the best long-term strategy to fight terrorism is development. This is how we prevent conflicts from starting in the first place. This is how we can ensure that peace is lasting after we fought. 
It's how we stop people from falling prey to extremism because children are going to school and they can think for themselves and families can feed themselves and aren't desperate. Obama criticized Congress for creating obstacles to his campaign promise to close the Guantanamo Bay prison. The number of inmates has been drastically reduced, but he said the costly detention center is a blot on the national honor. We can get these terrorists and stay true to who we are. And in fact, our success in dealing with terrorists through our justice system reinforces why it is past time to shut down the detention facility at Guantanamo. The outgoing president thanked U.S. troops for their commitment to protect the U.S. Constitution and the country's freedoms. Perhaps as a reminder to his successor, Obama said the United States is a society that can criticize a president without retribution. Slaritsa Hoek. VOA News, Washington. Well, the Democratic Party is looking to regroup after a tough election loss to Donald Trump and the Republican Party. That defeat means the Republicans will now control the Senate and the House of Representatives. VOA's national correspondent, Jim Malone, has more from Washington. Celebration time in Cincinnati as supporters of President-elect Donald Trump give the incoming 45th president a rousing welcome on his victory tour. In the true sense, history called and the people of this great state answered. And you're going to be very happy. We're going to say right now, what are we going to do? We're going to make America great again. You watch. It's a far different outlook for Democrats in the wake of Hillary Clinton's defeat. Democrats remain in the minority in the House and Senate and face questions about what kind of opposition they want to be during a Trump administration, says analyst John Fortier. Where does the party go? Is it a party that uh, really looks to some of its more progressive figures, Elizabeth Warren and others who would lead the party, or Bernie Sanders who lead the party in a more left direction? Or would they go in a direction more like you saw from Hillary Clinton, which is somewhat more in the middle of their party? Bernie! Sanders appears eager to take a leading role in urging Democrats to reassess their appeal to working class voters. There are millions of people today, working class people, middle class people, low income people who are living in despair. That change in emphasis is also in the mind of Ohio Congressman Tim Ryan who lost a bid to replace Nancy Pelosi as Democratic House leader. And I believe it in my heart that if we're going to win as Democrats, we need to have an economic message that resonates in every corner of this country. The party's future is also a focus for outgoing President Barack Obama. So there are going to be a, a, a core set of values that um, shouldn't be up for debate, should be our North Star. Uh, but how we organize politically, uh, I think is something that uh, we should spend some time thinking about. Large numbers of white working class voters flock to Trump this year, says conservative commentator Fred Barnes. And he did something that I thought Republicans <laughs> were going <laughs> to maybe never be able to do, and that is win Pennsylvania, win Ohio, win Michigan, and win Wisconsin, the Rust Belt, the Industrial Belt, where there's so many uh, uh, working class people, uh, a number of them out of work, but, but still an awful lot of them. Congressional Democrats must decide where they will oppose Trump and where they might find common ground. Jim Malone, VOA News, Washington. It's time now for a short break and still to come here on Africa 54, we'll look at how Tunisia is trying to reverse a decline in foreign investment. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. In Ghana, voting begins in election as President John Mahama seeks a second and final term. In the Gambia, family members of the hundreds who disappeared during the 22-year reign of President Yaya Jammeh 
hope for their return home. In Cameroon, Prime Minister Philemon Young visits the southwestern part of the country to address English-speaking minority protesters demanding more federalism and social reforms. In Uganda, former child soldier of Joseph Kony's Lord's Resistance Army pleads not guilty on 70 war crimes charges at the International Criminal Court. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. You're back with Africa 54. Tunisia is hoping to reverse a decline in foreign investment as its government struggles with a growing budget deficit. During a two-day investment summit in Tunis, billions of dollars and aid in loans were pledged to help energize the country's economy. VOA's Carolyn Turner has our report. Representatives from some 40 countries are in Tunis for the investment summit. Regional and Western partners promised Tunisia about $8 billion in aid through 2020, offering some respite for a post-revolution economy that has struggled to attract investment and create jobs. As well as seeking financial aid, Tunisia is trying to reverse a decline in foreign investment following the revolt that toppled Zini El Abidin Bel Ali five years ago. The North African country has been lauded as the sole political success story of the Arab Spring for its democratic transition, but it has made slow progress on economic reform. The funding includes $1.25 billion in aid from Qatar and a $2 billion loan over the next five years from the African Development Bank. Former Tunisian Foreign Minister Mungi Hadin described the event as a foundation for securing the country's future. I hope this conference will be the foundation of a new ground favorable to foreign investors, and I hope it will ease in the launching of their projects in Tunisia with the least amount of bureaucracy possible. With the European Investment Bank committing to about one-third of the loan, other countries are the Arab Fund for Economic and Social Development, Saudi Arabia, Italy, and Kuwait, and Turkey. Tunisia is expecting to sign deals worth 4.3 billion U.S. dollars to finance economic projects during the conference. We brought 44 private projects in this conference. The total investment amount is 67,000 million dinars. There are 142 projects, among them public sector, private sector, and private and public sector partnership projects. A senior economist warned that much of the aid is in loans, which will deepen the country's debt. France, the main sponsor of the event, along with Qatar, said it would allow Tunisia to convert debt into financing for new investments. Carolyn Turner, VOA News. And that is where we will leave it. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. And for more news, tune into VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight, at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings to Daybreak Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC. That's Monday through Friday. Thank you so much for watching. From all of us here in Washington, good night. to the Voice of America's News Words. This word deals with legal issues and travel. Extradited. Security officials say many young militants are inspired by Muslim cleric Abu Qatadab, who was extradited from Britain last year. Jordan's postponed his trial on charges of plotting to attack tourists at New Year celebrations in 2000, but previously convicted him for conspiring to attack U.S. targets in Jordan. Extradited means to move a prisoner between two countries. Sometimes a person commits a crime in one country and escapes to another. If the person is found, police can send him back to the country where he committed the crime and he could face a trial. Now when you hear the word extradited, 
you will know what this news word means.